been the executive director of Network, a Catholic, a national Catholic social justice lobby in Washington, D.C. since 2004. She is a religious leader, an attorney, a poet, with extensive experience in public policy and advocacy for systemic change. As an advocate for the poor, Sister Simone lobbies on issues such as health care, immigration reform, and economic policy. And as a noted speaker and educator on these public policy issues, she has been invited to such events as the Democratic National Convention and even the Colbert Report. <laughs> The organization Network was founded in 1971 and has since become a Catholic leader in the global movement for justice and peace. Recently, Network has gathered national attention through the Nuns on the Bus cross-country trips in which women religious brought national attention to economic and immigration policies. So please give a warm welcome to our speaker, Sister Simone Campbell. so much for coming out on a Sunday. Um, it really is an honor to be back here in St. Louis, and twice in one year is a bit surprising. But the delight is that you all here in the Midwest become what in DC uh, we talk about as bellwether. You all become the important sounding blocks that resonate on Capitol Hill. And even for people who are not from Missouri, often what happens here in the heartland is a indication of what people in Congress think they ought to do. And one of the challenges is they have gotten some wrong messages based on what I've picked up and that somehow we have to figure out those surprising ways to get justice heard in some new and unexpected ways. So hopefully today we can talk about uh, some of the economic justice pieces that are at risk right now. We'll talk a little bit about immigration reform and then we'll make sure that there's plenty of time for questions, answers, conversation, dialogue. Because I'll tell you, uh, for me, I'm always most interested in the kinds of things that you all are experiencing and what's happening. So we'll have a good chance for back and forth, give and take. And I must say that, Susan, when you opened with the idea of bringing something new into the world, the bus really was that, an experience of that. It is the experience and explosion of surprise because I never, in my wildest dreams, expected anything like what happened. I mean, join the convent, lead a quiet life. That's <laughs> what I've got to say. But this moment of opportunity to me indicates the level of hunger in our nation for some alternatives, for an alternative message, and for an alternative way of coming together. That hunger is at, I think, the base of the, the nuns on the bus experience. Because while Catholics came out uh, to experience it, lots of people came out, not just Catholics. And that was a surprise to me but then what I found is uh, many people said to me, you know, I don't really believe in much of anything. And while I'm worried about what your day job is, you know, the religion side of stuff, I really like what you say. It matters to me. And what I've come to realize is that in our nation, organized religion is not uh, necessarily um, how can I say this, in everybody's life. A lot of people have gotten turned off for a wide variety of reasons, some of which us Catholics could go on and on about. <laughs> but we won't, because we're disciplined, right? In the new year, the first day of the new year, we'll pick up your new year and say our new year's resolution is to look forward. But what we do know in our nation is that 
in this experiment of democracy, in this risk of trying to say that you don't need just one person making a decision, in this risky business of saying that we, the people, can govern ourselves, we, the people, are hungry to be the people and not just individuals, isolates, fearful, separated, having to go it alone. And that's the piece that I hope we can talk about today and how some of our economic policies show what we are caring about or what we're not caring about. Okay, so what I see is that we're going to chat a bit about the current US situation, then we're going to look at what works. It's so rare in Washington to talk about things that work. So I wanna give you some information about good programs that need to be supported. And then talk about effective way forward. What can we do together to move forward, okay? So let's start by talking what's happening economically in our society. What's going on? I believe I did this when I was here last time, but it's really important to understand what is happening in our nation to see the income shifts. What I need are five volunteers for a non-speaking part. And um, just come on up, come on up. SLU students, perfect. Come, one, two, three. Okay, so what we wanna do is just to understand economics in our society is to look at the change in income over the last, well, 30 years. We're gonna look at 30 years. Uh, we're actually gonna look from uh, 1979 to 2009. I want you to know that from 1949 to 1979, every group's income went up about 100%. The lowest 20% went up 116%, and the top went up 86%. So we'll remember from our math classes that if you take 116% of a small number, that's still gonna be kind of a small number, but it's a big percentage. And if you take 86% of a big number, that's gonna be a bigger number, right? We all remember that. But it's still about the same. So, Mary, why don't you be the top 20% of folks in our nation in terms of income? Uh, Cindy, why don't you be the next? So that's between 60 and 80% of income. And Margaret Mary, lovely. Why don't you be our beloved middle class? Everybody thinks they're in the middle class. Everybody. That'd be a very large middle class and not quite statistically possible, but. Okay, and Emily, why don't you be next to the bottom? And Allison, you'd be our beloved bottom. All right, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use one of these cords if that's all right. So what each of you is gonna do is come, watch, come, put your toes against the x-axis to be prepared. And what we're gonna do is take one step for every 5% change. Okay, got it? So, Mary, come on up, put your toes against, there you go. Okay, so I am pleased to tell you, Mary, that between 1979 and 2009, the top 20%, your people, their income rose 50%. Bravo, congratulations. So you get to take one step for every 5% change. So that's 10 steps. Okay, you ready? Now we'll count it out for her because I just told her it was a non-speaking part and that she didn't have to do anything. So we're gonna help. But also don't make them too teeny either, just regular steps. Okay, everybody ready? One, two, three, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Bravo, bravo. The next, this is between 60 and 80 percent of income in our, in our nation between 1979 and 2009. I am pleased to tell you that your income went up 23 percent. Congratulations. 30 years, a lot of work, but 
23%. So you get to take four and a half steps. You ready? Okay, on your mark, get set, go. One, two, three, four and a half. Well, slightly more, another inch or two, perfect. <laughs> okay, Margaret Marion, right? Why don't you come on up? The beloved middle class. All right, the beloved middle class for this same period, their income went up 11%. So you get two steps. Don't spend them all in one place either. You ready? One, two. All right, Emily. You are between 20 and 40% of income. And I am pleased to tell you, though slightly horrified, that in 30 years, your income went up 4%. So you get one step. One. Oh, she was very eager. Stepped right out there. Very good. Okay. And Allison. Okay, line yourself up. I am sorry to tell you, Allison, that the bottom 20% in the same 30-year period, you lost 7%. So you have to take a step and a half back. One, two. Look at this. We have the top 20 up here. Well done, Mary. Good work. And then look, we have Cindy. I knew it was a C, I couldn't, I couldn't call it up. Cindy, who's actually less than half of the top 20%. Look at that, she's only 23%, and Mary's 50%. And then you get 60% of our population closely consolidated with 11%, 4%, and a minus 7%. This is part of the challenge that we're facing in our nation when we come to economic disparities and economic justice. This is a huge place. Okay, now we're gonna add two more people. I need two more volunteers. Okay, so what's your name? Lori. Lori, why don't you come, put your feet, your toes against here. Okay, the top 5%, your income went up 73%. So you get 16 and a half steps. You ready? Okay. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen and a half. Well, a little more on the half. There you go. Okay, Lori. It's quite far out there now. Your name? Joyce. Joyce. The top one percent. You ready for this? The top 1%'s income has gone up in this 30-year period 170%. You get 34 steps. You ready? Okay, your mark, get set. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty, thirty one, thirty two, thirty three, thirty four. Joyce, can you still hear us? Okay. Now, I'd like to ask everybody to flip their page over so you can see what numbers we're talking about. Joyce's up there is 1.2 million or above per year. Income, it's not wealth, it's income. 1.2 million. Now, here we've got Lori's is 186,000 and above the top 5%. So it's a few people aggregated at the top getting big money. 
Then we get the top 20% is 100, Mary's category is 101,000 and above. Cindy's 62,000 to 101. Margaret Mary's is 38 to 62. Emily's is 20,000 to 38. But look at this, 20% of our population are down here at $20,000 or less. Who? Isn't that hard? It's, it, it's a family, it's a family unit. It's a family unit. So it could have, one of the things about this is, that makes it hard is that you could have different numbers of dependents. But one thing that we do know is that those at the top have fewer kids. Right? So, well, at least it seems that way. Um, the challenge is that those at the top don't know the common challenges that we face. Joyce and her friends often live in gated communities, use private schools, have private jets. The fact is, the distance between Joyce and the majority sets up a lack of understanding. And the fact that the top doesn't use the common good services, doesn't ride a bus, doesn't know what the needs are because they're so far away. And the only way I've ever been able to explain Governor Romney's statement in the last presidential election that 47% of the people are takers is just that he's so far away, he doesn't have a clue as to how hard it is to raise families down here at this, this level. What do you think? What, how does this strike you? What do you think? Unjust. Unjust. It's a, real challenge. a huge challenge. A huge challenge. Because one of the challenges is, is that it's the 80% that are raising the money for the 1%. They get, most of that money comes from dividends and interest. Some from salary. Now, who in our society makes $1.2 million or more in the salary? Who, who else? Bank presidents. Bank presidents. Sports people. No, Congress doesn't. Congress is actually, uh, is closer to 200,000. It's in the top 5%. Not quite as bad. Uh, law partners, big, fancy, sports, movie stars whose names I never recognize. Um, hedge fund managers. Now, one of the things that has happened, because we're going to look at policies that help create this wealth, notice that it started beginning in 1980. And what happened was, the privatization of retirement programs. When you privatize your retirement programs, then everyone who's going to retire, which is most of us, we hope, then becomes interested in the stock market. It was a way to improve the stock market, and we got interested in tax rates of the stock market. And what happens is, Interest in dividends, which is the principal source of income of Joyce and her friends, sorry Joyce, and your friends, is 15%. Whereas salaried income, salaried income for Lori and Mary and Cindy and Margaret Mary, well, and some for Emily and some for Allison, but you got, we're going to talk differently about that. That is at a higher rate than 15%. So when we start talking tax reform, and this coming spring is going to be a huge election year fight, well, it actually may happen this fall, a huge election year fight about tax reform, what you're going to hear is senior citizens have to stand up and protect their investments. 
and don't let them tax your dividends and interest at a higher rate. What it really is, is about Joyce and her friends making sure they get some preferential treatment. And so what you do, one of the proposals that's hanging out there is to say that if X percent of your income is from dividends and interest, then you get taxed at ordinary income rates. Does that make some sense? Because our country needs money. We have to be fiscally responsible. Because we care about the kind of nation that we leave to the youngest. Okay, so the challenge is some of the policies that we've made affected this greatly. And the other challenge is, is most of us never talk about it. That we never talk about this stuff to anybody. We only talk to people who think similarly. So what I've been trying to do is to talk to people who think differently and let people know. So I, I advocate grocery store missionary work. <laughs> when you're standing in the grocery store line, have you ever, you know, just ask, have you ever thought about the huge disparities that are going on in our country? Do you care? <laughs> well, maybe just because I live in D.C., you know, people do care. But it's interesting to hear their responses. Now, the challenge is I have to be prepared to listen if I ask the question. <laughs> I can't just whip out my handy-dandy solution. Right? But if I ask a question, i got to listen to the answer. Now, let's talk a little bit, uh, uh, now nah, I should let you all sit down. You, you, you've done well. We'll remember, okay, everybody's going to cement in their heads. You're not going to forget, especially where Emily and Allison are. Okay, don't forget this reality. And Joyce, you know, she was all the way out to that table out in the middle. That's how far she was. So praise God there were micro, uh, the speakers out there. Thank you very much, Barb Graff. You were fabulous. <laughs>
90% of those folks are employed. And then the remainder are elderly, disabled, that brings them up to 93%. And only 7% are unemployed and able to work. Isn't that shocking? Minimum wage is also going to be a big argument come the spring because it's always a great election year issue. But do you know that minimum wage in our nation, if it was going to have the same buying power that it did in 1970, would have to be $12.50 an hour instead of $7.25. The fact is, we as a nation, through our representatives, have chosen, have chosen, rather than raising wages, we'll create a safety net. Because we do believe workers should be able to eat. Does that make some sense? Not much, but so. I mean, you get the idea. The challenge is, is that the folks in Congress are at, up there in the top, and a bunch of them don't know what it is to struggle at the bottom. I was recently, uh, last, this, this week I was in South Dakota. We stopped along the way at one of those, you know, small little cafes to have lunch. And um, I was shocked. Shocked? Do you know, at this little cafe on our way to Yankton, you could get a full roast beef sandwich, mashed potatoes, with a few pathetically overcooked vegetables <laughs> for $5.50. And I realized minimum wage in small rural places, maybe you could get by on. And then I realized one of the challenges is we have a whole bunch of senators from small rural places and the deal struck in the Constitution that gives every state two senators is working to our disadvantage economically because those folks don't know what a pressure it is to try to live in Washington, D.C. on minimum wage. It's not possible. The challenge that we face is trying to educate ourselves and our representatives to the truth of the struggle. Therein lies the challenge. So what in God's green earth got us into this mess we're in economically? Because quite frankly, up until about a year ago, the deficit was of concern. It wasn't the sky is falling type of concern because a bunch of us are old enough to remember the 2000 election. How many remember the 2000 presidential election? All right, this is gonna be a moment in history for the folks that don't. What was the big debate in the 2000 election? Do you remember? What do we do with our surplus? A mere 13 years ago, the big question was, what do you do with our surplus? Lock yeah, lockbox. Get it in that lockbox. But the, the challenge is, the party that won was the party that said, give it back to the taxpayers. Give it back to the taxpayers, they know how to spend the money best. Well, when you give taxes back to the taxpayers, the one, guess who's gonna get most of the money back? <laughs> Joyce and her friends. Lori's gonna do pretty well too. Now the challenge of that is, the theory was, oh, they'll make jobs. <laughs> now last year on the bus, I kept saying, because our, our whole message is about reasonable revenue for responsible programs, and my, I kept saying was, if you keep giving money back to wealthy people, expecting them to make jobs, 
and you have yet to see a job, then you know what the definition of insanity is? <laughs> you keep doing the same thing over and over, but you expect a different result. Oh, bright. We've never been noted for being really bright sometimes, except I think really in this instance, it was the effort to control the outcome and benefit a few. And this is where the intersection of economics and politics becomes very worrisome in our nation. The only thing that is going to trump money in politics are people. And that's why coming out today is an important piece for your education. I know some of you uh, were saying to me before as I was chatting with you, well, you know, we are the choir. You know, we are the choir. <laughs> we're the ones that know all this. But I have a friend in DC that says, you know, we have choir practice for a reason. <laughs> so the important piece is that we learn and then we do missionary work. You can have little choral arrangements. I don't know, I just thought of this. Maybe you could shop together at the grocery store and <laughs> cover all the different lines or support each other in asking that tough question. But it really is true that we have got to break this open. So what got us into this mess? Why is 2000 not, this, not the same reality now? Well, first of all, the Bush era tax cuts. There were two Bush era tax cuts that as of last year accounted for 35% of the deficit, of the imbalance. Okay, 35%. It is the biggest part. The second is that we put two wars on a credit card. I opposed the Iraq war. I was sort of ambivalent about Afghanistan. But the fact is, we were irresponsible in not paying for them. If they were worth fighting, they were worth paying for. And rather than pay for them, what we did was basically put them on a credit card. And you know what that crafty Bush administration did? Crafty, crafty. They financed two wars in what we called supplementals. So they never showed up in the budget. And a supplemental is supposed to be for emergency funding. And so the Bush administration, about every January, February, would say, oh, surprise, we're at war. We couldn't predict it. We need a supplemental. Hurry it through Congress and get it funded because our troops on, you know, on the battlefield need it. Then what happened? The Obama administration ran on the idea that they would include the wars in the budget. So now Republicans say, the Obama administration, the budget's been totally out of whack, running up this deficit. It's only because they included the wars in the budget and didn't pretend they were surprised. So two wars account for about 20%. Medicare Part D, which those of us that are old enough to know Medicare know it's this odd prescription drug benefit that we sort of love to hate, but that actually wasn't paid for either. And so they gave a benefit without collecting any money. So when uh, Republicans start saying, well, you know, Medicare is just out of control, costs out of control, it's partially their fault because they didn't fund it. That accounts for about 1%. The recession, when the recession came, then revenues went down. That accounts for about 17%. And the other thing Republicans love to hate is Fannie Mae, um, the investment ARA, TARP, all these things that were bailouts for the economic recession, that only accounts for 7%. So you can understand all of this, but the biggest single factor by about three or four times is the Bush era tax cuts. But for the Bush era tax cuts, this austerity message would not be what it is today. Now, they did make some progress in the deal that was cut last year. These are 2011 figures. Because in 2012, in the last time we had a crisis, 
the high end, the top 2%, well, actually, it's not top 2%, it's top 400,000, uh, $400,000 and above the, for that amount of money, about above $400,000 per year when it's earned income, not dividends and interest, there is, uh, the Bush era tax cuts ended. So Joyce and her friends had to pay a little bit more. It helped. But I think what is really going on with all this finances is the struggle for the soul of our nation. And this is the part that worries me most. And this is why I think people respond to the bus. Because it's easy to blame Joyce or to say that Emily and Allison should work harder or that it's really Mary's fault or it's Margaret Mary's fault for being the middle class. The fact is, we're all responsible. And so one of the things that I've started thinking about is that an unexpected consequence of all of the fabulous work done about civil rights, trying to atone for the sin of our past, for slavery and for discrimination and for um, all of the ways that we have um, discriminated against people. One of the unintended consequences from civil rights is that we all got into our groups to demand our rights. And I, as a woman, since the Vatican says, says I promote radical feminist themes, I might as well <laughs> claim it. But one of the challenges is, I want my rights. And then we get Hispanic folks, Latinas, they should have their rights, and African Americans should have their rights, and LGBTQ community should have their rights, and white males that get left out of everything else, they should have their rights. <laughs> I mean, we should all have our rights. But there was a way in which that carried through all these years, these 50 years of struggle, has divided us. And I've begun to think that rather than just looking at civil rights, we need to look at the other side which I'm thinking might be civil obligations. In a democracy, we hold obligations to each other. We, the people, are responsible for the government we get. Scary thought, especially when you know them up close and personal like I do. So that economics, because our society is based around free market and based around this whole idea of capitalism as being next to godliness, economics becomes the measure of where our heart is as a nation. And we the people were sort of lacking in this regard. So I have worked to try to say Civil obligations are how we contribute to form this more perfect union. I'm currently writing a book. Can you believe this? All this in a book, too. Anyway, April 15th is supposed to go on sale. All I have to do is finish the blessed thing. But, <laughs> but in the book, I'm trying to talk about what does it mean to come together as a nation when we disagree. And how can we break open our isolation and our fear and come together? So what I want to do first in this little part is to share with you some of the programs that work, because I think it's a way that can show us a way forward. The programs that work for low-income people are things like the Earned Income Tax Credit, EITC. It is the single most important program we have. And what that is, is a family where there's a custodial parent, has kids in the household, and you make in the same realm as what uh, Emily and Allison made, you can file your tax return and you get money back from the federal government. It's a refundable tax credit. Additionally, the child tax credit is the other way of getting money into low-income families. It is it requires somebody who's working in the household, 
it requires uh, uh, child tax credit has a whole bunch of weird complications you don't need to know about, but they are the most effective mechanisms for getting money to working families. Additionally, programs like SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance. SNAP is the best program. There is the least waste, fraud, and abuse in SNAP. Pell Grants are the single most important way to help people get out of poverty. Education is still the way out of poverty, and Pell Grants get you there. Uh, last year, I was up at the Saint, uh, Chestnut Hill Academy and uh, talking to a bunch of people. I, I mean, you know, like you folks. Only it was students. It was all students. And afterwards, freshmen came up to me. and It was so sweet. They wanted my autograph and pictures taken. It was really cool. And I was really touched. And then this one young woman asked me to, um, to talk to me after everybody left. So I talked to her. And it turns out she was so committed to President Obama being reelected because she knew if he wasn't elected, she wouldn't be able to continue in school. Because as a freshman, she had Pell Grants and scholarships from Chestnut Hill. And she knew that, President, that Governor Romney was running on the idea of doing away with them. And then she tells me, so I'm listening to her, she tells me that in the middle of July, her mom and her, and her mom's boyfriend had been arrested, that they didn't have any money, so that her mom was still in detention, pretrial detention. I don't know what they were arrested for. But this young woman ended up being homeless because she's a, as an only child, couldn't keep, you know, she had a part-time job to help pay for uh, college, but she couldn't keep the apartment. And she was homeless. She said, well, it's only for a couple weeks. And then finally the dorm opened. And she's telling me this all stoic. And I think, oh my gosh, how would that be? And then she tells me that she had just gotten her first paper back. And she had only gotten a B plus. And with that, she burst into tears. And I thought, oh my glory. And I hugged her and I said, well, what's up? And she says, I'm so afraid I won't be able to make the, make the grade. I won't be able to do the work because she was used to getting A's. I threw my arms around her, held her, we wept together. She had asked for my autograph. Well, I asked for her autograph so that I could carry her with me and her concerns. And then she said to me, could I put my mom's name down too? So Brittany and Tony, Tony's her mom, travel with me. But it's Pell Grants that are making the difference for this family. And it's those kinds of stories that Joyce and her friends out the door need to know about. But it's those kinds of stories that we've got to tell. So Pell Grants is one of the most effective. Now, one of the biggest holes in our current system is housing. Housing stock is being dilapidated. There has been no significant housing policy since the Johnson era. Now, those of us that are old enough to remember President Johnson, that's a long time. It's very worrisome. And we have all of this foreclosed housing, but no way to convert it to low-income housing or to use it in any other realistic way. And there is next to no support for people working. The Emily's and Allison's down here working for minimum wage, low income folks. What, what you, and twenty thousand dollars a year? What do you do for childcare? What do you do for transportation when you have to take the bus or try, for heaven's sake, to drive a car? It's wages that are a big problem. But if we're going to insist on having low wages, we got to find some way of getting our people to work. Uh, not too long ago, I was in Prescott, Arizona. Prescott is, uh, I found out, was snowbird country. You all probably know about snowbirds. I don't know, where, where folks go from winter, where there's a lot of snow, down to Arizona. Well, in Arizona, they thought they didn't have any problems with poverty. But it turns out the retirees need assistance. And they pay low wages. And they have no, they only have one bus. One bus that runs up and down the main street so that the workers have no possibility of getting to serve the seniors that they're there to serve. 
So all of a sudden, there's an insurrection in Prescott where the seniors are demanding a better bus service. Because see, we are in this together. We are our brother's keepers. We are our sister's keepers. But the reason why we are that is because if we keep them, we keep us. The fact is, we benefit if everyone benefits. So what do we do? Oh, wait a minute, one more. Healthcare, 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 healthcare. I'm sure you're all tired of hearing about the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, that the sky is falling and it's terrible. The louder they yell, it's because it's gonna make a difference for us. And the insurance industry really hates losing as much money, as much profits, and curtailing their CEO salaries and dividends and interest. That's what's fueling this ridiculous fight right now. The fact is, and the reason why governors don't, some governors don't want Medicaid expansion is because if you don't expand Medicaid, it's the Achilles heel of the Affordable Care Act. Because if you don't expand Medicaid, the payments to hospitals to serve the uninsured are automatically going down because the idea was that money would then go to cover Medicaid. But if you don't expand Medicaid, the money goes down anyway and your hospitals are crippled. Got it? So you gotta join up with your hospitals. Hospitals are really hot on getting Medicaid expansion. So those of us activists, it's fun to go lobby with CEOs. <laughs> they're, they're great people to lobby with. But it's really important that you understand it's the last gasp of the insurance industry to be able to have unregulated profits. That's what's going on. Oh, don't you love capitalism? All traditions say it's how you care for those at the margins of society that is the measure of faith. In the Christian tradition, we hear it in James. In the Jewish tradition, we hear it in just about any, any prophet you can think of, my favorite is Isaiah. In the Islamic tradition, you hear it in the Quran all the time about caring for those who are left out, that that is the measure of your faith. So what do we do? Well, we've got to come together and care passionately. We have to care passionately that we live the constitutional values because those are the ones that we've agreed upon as our nation. So we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, have got to establish justice. And Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, Pope anybody you can think of, has said that you cannot have charity until you have justice. Justice must come first. And the dignity of each individual demands basic food, education, health care. Housing. Those are the basic principles that promote the dignity of every individual. And so if you're really pro-life, you're going to be pro-dignity of everybody. Some of you have heard me say this, but, you know, the idea of valuing the dignity of each person sort of got hijacked by those people that favor birth only. It's really important that we value all of life. That means after folks are born, too. <laughs> so it's a huge challenge. But, but a piece of our faith has been manipulated to serve the interests of business. And I think, I don't know if they know it, but it's certainly true. Um, we've got to find a way, so we have to um, establish justice. But the other place that's so important in establishing justice is balancing our budget. Balancing our budget, especially in the area of military expenditures. Because what's happened in military expenditures is that it's over the last 12 years, it's been an explosion of expenditures without accountability. So I'm taking a, a page from the Republican playbook. I love doing this. This is so much fun. Because the Republicans are trying to say that, well, you know, fiscal responsibility, we just can't afford these poverty programs. You know, they're not working anyway, so, well, we just can't afford them. We have to cut off food for people now so we can feed people in the future. I, I've been told that. That's a quote. It's so hard to be nonviolent sometimes. <laughs> but, 
but so the play, so what I'm doing is saying with the, the military budget, we do not have the luxury, in tough financial times, we do not have the luxury of no bid contracts. We do not have the luxury of having no audits or no accountability. In tight financial times, we need to get every penny of value we can from our tax dollars. And the biggest place to look right now is the Pentagon. Pentagon spending is out of control, and we need to rein it in. Isn't that kind of fun? We've never been able to do it from the nonviolence argument, but we can do it from the economic argument, because it's absolutely true. We cannot afford all this money that we're throwing at them. And let's just, me, just let me say a word about Syria. Um, it took Network a while to develop a position on Syria because we were waiting to hear from the Good Shepherd Sisters and the, daughter, uh, the sisters of Char Daughters of Charity that are in uh, Syria. They're Syrian sisters. And I met them a few years ago, and finally we heard from them. And the sisters tell, told us that the sisters in Damascus are afraid of the rebels. They're afraid of the government. The government had always protected them. They had protected religious minorities. But they were now afraid of the government, but they were even more afraid of the US and what the US might do. So for us then, it became imperative that we, that we be strong and say, no, a targeted bombing is never that targeted. And we have to be realistic. This is not a military option. There, there's no good military solution. I mean, that's what they said about Iraq and look at the mess we made. So we can't start another one. But it's an economic re argument that can get as much power as the humanitarian argument because of the values in our odd society. So what do we do? Establish justice. Ensure domestic tranquility. Well, if we continue in this huge income disparity, we will not have domestic tranquility for much longer, if I can help it. We're going to try, but what we have to do is lift up how it's not fair. And most people at the top think, oh my heavens, they don't know this. The other piece is that I didn't say is that I was giving a talk at Trenton College of New Jersey, and this one got, young man in the room said, discovered he was not middle class. He had always thought his family was middle class. And he realized when we turned over the signs and found out what the income was, his family was in the bottom. He had never known that. And his parents had protected him and his sister so that they could get to college. Well, he started to cry because he realized how grateful he was to his parents. So somehow we have got to let people know what reality is. Then, okay, so these are our values these are the ways forward, and we've got to change our budget. We've got to register our voice. We've got to lift up the fact that we, as a nation, are community. And if we have adequate resources for our priorities, we have reasonable revenue for responsible programs. And so my last little piece is to tell you that the interfaith community in DC has created a budget. Well, most of a budget. Um, we've got our principles. We've got our all of the things that follow. And it's basically reasonable revenue for responsible programs. You can find it online at faithfulbudget.org. The St. Joe's people would probably like it a lot because all of your points are included up here, except for maybe VAWA. VAWA may or may not be in here. I'm not sure. But the, the Violence Against Women Act. But all of your points are in here in the faithful budget. These are based on our Catholic, Jewish, Islamic, Sikh, uh, who else do we have in this crowd? A, a wide variety of the interfaith crowd. It is possible to make a difference, and this is how to do it. So, people of St. Louis, we're counting on you. We're counting on you to use your voice. We're counting on you to do missionary work in the grocery store. We're counting on you to speak up. Now. I know some of you probably have brothers or sisters 
uh, akin to my brother Jim. So I have this new theory, because the Lord knows I couldn't talk to my brother Jim. So I think we should just swap brothers. It's way easier. <laughs> it's way easier to talk to somebody else's brother than talk to my own. So I will trade you one brother Jim for yours. How's that? <laughs> But the important point is, is to speak with respect, to speak with caring hearts, to open our hearts to the fact that we're in this together. And the only way forward is for the 100%, for all of us together to come together and say, we the people of the United States will form a more perfect union. We will establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, Provide for the common defense, not the special defense, the common defense, and promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves yep, and our posterity, the kids from St. Joe's, the kids from SLU, our grandkids, our kids from where? CRC from right here? For heaven's sakes, of course. But it's us and our posterity. And if we do that, then I think God will say, ooh, well done, good and faithful. Come on in. Where your treasure was, there was your heart. And that made all the difference. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>